Hi everyone, I'm John Foran. I'm talking to you from my home in Santa Barbara, California, where I teach at the university. Um, I'd like to thank Javad for the invitation to speak to you. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your interest in fragile resistance. And uh, I've been asked to say a few things about how I look at the book today actually 25 years after it came out. So I'm going to do that. But first, a couple of caveats. Um, first apology is that I'm speaking to you in English because I am far from fluent in Persian. Um, so thank you. Second is that I am by no means um, expert or knowledgeable about Iran today. I have not followed uh, as closely as I did in the book events in Iran and I don't really write about Iran anymore. Um, so you have to understand that I can't really illuminate the present situation in Iran. Um, except indirectly if there's anything of value in the perspective in the book. Uh, and that would really be up to you. I'm going to talk more about the perspectives in the book, uh, the theoretical framework, uh, and what it means today uh, for scholarship and activism, and um, less about the arguments in the book per se, but of course I'll touch on those. So here goes. Uh, the book itself is out of print in the United States. It was published by Westview Press and I'm very grateful to them. It was turned down by other presses as too long uh, because the book itself is based on a dissertation that is almost 800 pages and it had to be cut down uh, two times to get to the uh, length it is today and painful as that was I think it makes it a better book um, and then uh, it was only published in a very uh, limited edition 600 hardback copies which were very expensive $50 at the time was super expensive for a book and no paperback so when the publisher uh, didn't want to publish it reissue it publish more copies of it um, that was tough and I was all the more grateful then that the book was translated into Persian um, as you know, not just once but twice um, and made available as an inexpensive paperback, relatively inexpensive paperback. And the fact that I would have, therefore, Iranian readers um, is a huge uh, honor for me. And the fact that over the years I've heard from uh, students and scholars in Iran about the book being read um, and being appreciated, it's been extremely uh, appreciated by me. I feel that the book therefore has reached the audiences it's meant to reach. And I'm also happy that after 10 years of not being in print, the copyright in English came back to me so that uh, I was able to put it up on a website as a PDF for free that anybody in the world could read. And frankly, that would be a great project if someone wanted to do that for the Persian edition of the book as well. Um, because of my limited grasp of Persian, I can't comment on the translations. That would be something for you to do and let me know what you think. Um, so let's take a look at the book itself. And as I said, I'm going to focus on the theories. And at least in the English edition, we have on page 12, yeah, 
we have whoa, we have this diagram. There we go. Uh, it's all there. Um, this gives a good look at the overview of the theories, uh, the perspectives that I brought to the book as a student. I should say the book goes back to about 1979 or 80 when uh, as a graduate student in sociology at UC Santa Barbara and doing my master's thesis I began to think and write and research about Iran. Of course in 78 that was the fall of, that I began graduate school Iran was in the news and um, that of course got my attention. Also I had the um, pleasure of getting to know Iranian students at UC Santa Barbara, many of whom were activists following the revolution very carefully. Marxists, or liberals, Islamic Marxists and radicals. Um, and I got to know some of them quite well which was wonderful for me because I began to understand the politics of Iran from the inside much better and began to be exposed to analysis of Iran from uh, Marxist perspectives. Meanwhile, as a graduate student, I was uh, immersed in social theory. Uh, as an undergraduate, I come across Marxism and the particular form of it that attracted me was what we could call existential Marxism which is a, um, a synthesis of Marxism and existentialism, the French philosophy uh, associated with Jean-Paul Sartre who became a Marxist uh, later in life when he realized that existentialism as insightful as it was into the psychology of the individual, uh, the identity of individuals, the ability and necessity of individuals to make decisions and choices and act in the world had to be supplemented by a social analysis. And it was Sartre's view in the early 1960s that this meant Marxism. And so as a graduate student in the late uh, 1970s, I encountered Marxism through the lens of existentialism. And this was important because um, it meant that there was going to be an emphasis on human agency, that revolutions uh, aren't just caused by structural factors lining up correctly, as many uh, Marxists thought, and as uh, the leading sociologist of revolution state, a Scotch pole, who's mentioned in the book, uh, thought in her theory, a structural theory of what causes revolutions. I felt that structure and agency had to be considered together, uh, which is a fairly obvious point, um, and a dialectical point. There's a dialectic between social structure and social movements. And uh, that's how I came to the Iranian Revolution. I was, of course, tremendously impressed by what happened in Iran in 1978 and 79. Uh, here we had one of the great revolutions of the 20th century uh, being caused, uh, clearly being uh, led by people and uh, their agency making the difference. And in fact, the only revolution of the 20th century that was not made by uh, a guerrilla army by, it was made instead by uh, an unarmed population for the most part. Uh, they came out nonviolently, uh, although they were met by tremendous violence of the state, um, and toppled a regime that seemed uh, all powerful, that had the fourth or fifth largest army in the world that was backed uh, with all kinds of weapons and uh, the foreign policy of the United States. Um, and yet the Shah was overthrown, uh, seemingly as, came a, as a huge surprise pretty much to everyone. So that was a world historical event and remains so. And it remains significant in the history of revolutions and the history of the 20th century. And in fact, it's relevant for uh, movements for radical social change in our century because they've 
follow the Iranian path for the most part um, by being nonviolent. So if we look at Occupy, if we look at the Arab Spring, um, if we look at the Green Revolution again in Iran in 2009, which probably uh, was the first blow of the Arab Spring, um, we see nonviolence as the chosen tactic, and I think that's wise, and I think that's the future of revolutions. Um, so to return to the theory, the book was an attempt to do a sophisticated Marxist analysis of the Iranian revolution. Um, I was influenced by not just existential Marxism, but by dependency analysis, a Latin American perspective on um, how social structures in Latin America over time historically have been shaped by relations with powerful economies in the core of the world system. Thus, world system theory with its core periphery, semi-periphery model, Emmanuel Wallerstein, uh, entered into the sort of neo-Marxist synthesis uh, I made theoretically. And the third part of Marxism, fourth actually, since we have existential Marxism, dependent development as it's called by uh, Fernando Cardoso and Enzo Paleto for Latin America, world system theory, Emmanuel Wallerstein, and then modes of production analysis, which I learned about in graduate school as well that gave us a much more uh, nuanced and powerful way of understanding class structure, uh, especially in the past, before capitalism, and as capitalism was uh, coming into place in the world between the 15th and the 19th centuries. Modes of production really opened up a way to understand social structure, around the world and in what would become the third world, the global south, uh, in ways that were much more sophisticated than Marxists at the time were looking at, looking for a single mode of production that they might call the Asiatic mode of production or the tributary mode of production, Sami Amin. Um, and that was the debate, or even feudalism. So those were the sort of positions that were available uh, for Iranian social structure in, say, the 16th century, before any contact with the West. And indeed, although I was interested in the causes of the Iranian Revolution of 1978-79, because the theory uh, of dependent development and modes of production and world system theory uh, told me I had to look at how the Iranian social structure had been shaped over the centuries, starting in the 1600s, by contact with a world market economy that was uh, being put in place by European powers in the core of the emerging world capitalist economy. And so that's why I went back to the start of the reign of the Safavids in 1500, 1501, to establish a baseline of what the social structure of Iran looked like before contact with the West. And that's where modes of production really helped. And we have uh, these very complex models of several modes of production uh, and many classes describing the social formation of Iran in the 16th and 17th centuries. And I think that was a huge um, step forward in Marxist analysis of pre-capitalist social structures in general and in Iran. Also, the world system theory uh, led me to try and chart the entry of Iran into the world system uh, of capitalism. And of course, in the 16th century, in world system terms, Iran was not part of that world system. It was in the external arena from the point of view of Europe, as Wallerstein would have put it. And perhaps more accurately, Iran was part of other regional and would-be world systems involving uh, the Ottoman Empire to the west and um, China to the north and the Mughal Empire in India to the east. 
um, that was a budding world system in the 16th century that uh, ultimately was displaced by uh, the rise of capitalism in Western Europe. And uh, Iran moving from the external arena of that world system in the 1600s and 1700s into the periphery of the world system where most of the colonized world found itself by the 17th, 18th centuries. And finally we come to the 19th century uh, after the turmoil of the 18th century, the collapse of the Safavids in 1722, the rise of Nader Shah, um, the struggles for uh, political hegemony in Iran at the end of the 18th century, giving us the Qajar dynasty uh, by 1801, and the dynasty that then ruled, of course, throughout the 19th century until 1925, and the coup that brought Reza Shah and the Pahlavis to power. It was in that 19th century that Iran's contact with um, the world economy in the form of trade relations, diplomatic relations with both Russia and with England in particular, and the uh, competition between those two in Iran for control, um, put Iran on the path of dependent development, uh, a kind of early capitalism um, in Iran, and firmly put Iran into the periphery of the world system. Um, modes of production now began to include petty commodity production and a small capitalist sector uh, by the end of the 19th century. And also by the end of the 19th century, we see the first uh, nationwide social movements aimed at, as all social movements in Iran have been since, aimed at um, confronting foreign control of the economy and politics of Iran with the Tobacco Rebellion in 1890 and confronting uh, the abuses of uh, the monarchy, the state. Uh, and then the great struggle of the Constitutional Revolution from 1905 to 1911, the uh, turmoil just before the rise of Reza Khan in um, the late 19-teens, um, the establishment of the Pahlavi dynasty in 1925, the uh, uprisings in Azerbaijan and Kurdistan in 1945 and 46, the oil nationalization movement under Mossadegh in 1951 to 53, again ended by a coup d'etat put in place by the United States. And um, finally, the period of intense dependent development, capitalist development, um, the rise of Iran into the semi-periphery of the world economy, um, the establishment of a very repressive state, uh, exclusionary, uh, non-democratic, repressive, all power concentrated in the person of the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. Um, by the 1960s and into the 70s. And so that's kind of the theoretical framework in which I tried to tell the story of the history of Iran uh, from the perspective of understanding how Iran's class structure evolved over time and how Iran became part of the world economy, the world capitalist economy over time. Um, and the complexities of class structure over time. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up very shortly. The other parts of the theory, the part where existential Marxism and agency entered into the theory was through this notion of political cultures of opposition and resistance, a concept, I guess, that I coined um, to try and explain the various currents of um, culture, political culture that evolved in Iran under these conditions. So ideas about nationalism, Mossadegh, ideas about um, socialism, the uh, left in Iran in the 1970s, ideas about liberalism, Mehdi Bazargan's movement in the 60s and 70s, 
the rise of uh, that being a version of an Islamic version of liberalism, um, more radical forms of Islamic thought, uh, represented both by Ali Shariati, a kind of Islamic uh, socialist approach, um, and then of course by Ayatollah Khomeini, a militant um, Islamism. Uh, at least five currents of political cultures contending during the revolution and making possible this broad coalition of forces that came to the streets and made the revolution. Um, a multi-class broad alliance of social forces uh, is what it took for a nonviolent, unarmed revolution against a heavily armed and repressive state backed by the United States to come to power. Um, now that cultural turn, as it were, in uh, sociology of revolutions was a direct response to Theta Scotchpole, whom I mentioned earlier, who really had made uh, a huge contribution to the sociology of revolution in the United States with her book States and Social Revolutions, a comparative analysis of France, Russia, and China, where she uh, claimed that revolutions are not made, they come, that is, they occur when internal and external uh, conditions line up in a particular way that undermine the state and enable a revolution to occur. And so counter to that, taking a lot of that perspective, making it a more sophisticated kind of Marxism, uh, and a look at states in the third world, uh, and then bringing in the notion of agency through political cultures of opposition, I tried to develop a more comprehensive, multifaceted uh, synthesis of the causes of revolutions, at least in the third world. And Iran was the test case. The first case I studied in depth, the one where I came to this particular theoretical synthesis. Um, and the rest of my scholarship has grown out of that. Uh, testing that theory based on the single case of Iran, which Scotchpole had considered an anomaly, an outlier, um, because it wasn't a structural uh, case of a simple structurally made revolution. Uh, she acknowledged that, but she thought Iran was an exception. And whereas I thought Iran was uh, the key uh, to thinking about revolutions across the 20th century, in places like Mexico, 1910, uh, China in the 1940s, Cuba in the 1950s, and Nicaragua, which had its revolution in exactly the same period that Iran did, 78 and 79. Uh, that became, many years later, my second book, Taking Power on the Origins of Social Revolutions in the Third World. Um, Iran was crucial for my understanding of what caused revolutions and that book showed that uh, what had happened in Iran could be um, generalized and applied to other cases very uh, instructively. Um, finally to bring the story to a close in the next minute and a half uh, after studying social revolutions more widely, the 20th century historical record. Uh, we entered the 21st century and I began to take note of movements like the Global Justice Movement that shut down the WTO in Seattle in 1999. Um, and of course in 2011 the Arab Spring and Occupy. And at the same time I became, I have become fascinated by and encouraged by the rise of the global climate justice movement, which for reasons I won't go into here, I think has become uh, the face of a global revolution that will have to happen in the next period, 10 years, 15 years, if humanity is to survive uh, the climate crisis. So, um, that is my brief overview of the book. Um, I look forward to hearing from any of you your thoughts. Please do correspond with me 
and uh, Javad has uh, told me that we'll be able to speak uh, in person or rather uh, in real time over Skype at some point. So thank you all and um, may this conversation continue.